and welcome to Next Generation Finance, an SCB podcast about sustainable finance. My name is Lina Afshava. I'm an analyst in climate and sustainable finance at SCB. And today I'm going to talk to Heike Reikald, who is the head of investor relations and sustainable finance at the World Bank. Hi, Heike. How are you? Hi, Lina. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for joining us. So we'll be talking about how the World Bank, also known as the International Bank for Construction and Development, addresses sustainable finance. And we'll look into how it raises funds, what types of projects it invests in, and what kinds of financial instruments it uses to do so, and other details about the World Bank's work. However, before we dive into that conversation with Heike, I do want to highlight that COP26, the UN Climate Summit, has concluded in Glasgow just a little over a week before we are recording this episode. And the summit saw a number of developments, such as pledges and alliances joined by countries and companies from around the world. And they've set goals for the transition towards net zero emissions and keeping the rising temperatures well below 2 degrees Celsius. Among other things, we saw the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero joined by over 140 financial institutions. We also saw a number of pledges, such as the pledge for reducing methane emissions by 30% by 2030, and others for ending deforestation and phasing out coal power and other fossil fuels, just to name a few. Another topic that received quite a lot of attention at the summit was climate financing for developing countries. In particular, um, we heard a lot of statements by country representatives from poor, quote-unquote, countries, especially island states and countries in the so-called Global South, who were talking about how much they need support when it comes to climate adaptation and mitigation, and especially financial support. And all this in the light of the fact that they are oftentimes a lot more, um, a lot more susceptible to the negative impacts of climate change. So here's where I want to ask a question to you, Heike. The World Bank being the largest financier of climate finance for developing countries, why is this topic so important? Thanks for that uh, question, Nina. And thanks again for inviting me to this this podcast. I think it's a really good opportunity to learn from others in this space. Um, And, you know, we're all in one way or another trying to contribute to a more sustainable future. So sharing um, knowledge and experiences is super important. So to your question um, about why climate finance is so important to the World Bank, uh, we're an international development organization and we raise funds in the capital markets and use those funds for projects in developing countries and emerging market countries to help them achieve their development goals. And the World Bank's goals are to eradicate extreme poverty and boost shared prosperity Um, That last goal addresses income inequality. And if we don't address climate change, we can't achieve those goals. So when we speak to investors in our bonds, um, we emphasize that emerging market countries and investments in emerging market countries are important for everyone um, and not just living those people living in emerging market or developing countries. Um, So we live on one planet and uh, focusing on investments that help reduce greenhouse gas emissions in developed countries is critical. But we also have to make sure that investment flows continue to emerging and developing countries to support their efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, while they still um, can achieve their development goals, such as reducing poverty and improving access to education and healthcare. If we don't, the climate will get worse for everyone and uh, we'll have hundreds of millions of more climate refugees, more poverty, more inequality. Um, you know, the effects of climate change really doesn't recognize borders. Um, now I do want to move on to talking specifically about the World Bank and the work that you do. And the reason why I want to do it is because I believe pretty much everyone knows the name World Bank but I don't think everyone knows exactly how you work. So I was hoping that you would um, tell us a little bit more about that. So what is World Bank? And also, what is your mandate? Okay, thanks. So I mentioned a little bit already, but um, uh, basically the World Bank is an international development bank. We're owned by 189 countries 
And our mandate is to reduce extreme poverty and boost shared prosperity. And that second goal addresses um, inequality. So those are what's referred to as the twin goals of the World Bank. And our owners are also our clients. So the World Bank is officially called International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, as you said earlier. Um, and we provide financing to middle income countries to help them achieve their development goals. And we do that by financing projects in sectors such as education, health, sustainable transportation, but also renewable energy or energy efficiency um, and projects that help build resilience, which is the topic today. But one thing that I would like to mention is that um, climate is included in all of the World Bank's activities because it's such a big problem. Uh, there is another member of the World Bank group that focuses on poorer countries and provides grants and zero interest loans um, to the poorest countries. And that organization is called IDA, the International Development Association. And IDA has been around for over 60 years, but only recently started accessing the capital markets. And um, IDA and uh, World Bank or IBRD have many similarities, but um, in, for this podcast, I'm going to focus on, on IBRD. And IBRD has been in the markets issuing bonds for um, 75 years now. You know, when I hear uh, reconstruction and development, I think social, right? But you did say that uh, climate change or climate change thinking is uh, like a thread that goes through all of your work as well. So I was wondering if you could elaborate on that and explain how you do that. Um, so, as you say, the World Bank has a social mandate, so our goals are social goals, um, but climate change affects uh, people, um, and if we don't tackle climate change, we can't achieve our goals. It, it's completely woven into and integrated into our mandate, and that's why, as, as I said, all of our projects, in one way or another, we consider uh, climate, whether it's just assessing uh, the projects for, for, for climate risks, or in the case of IBRD, 95% of the projects have so-called climate co-benefits, which means that there are certain pieces of the projects that are um, financing something related to either climate mitigation, so reducing the effects of, of climate change, uh, or something that uh, helps build resilience. And if you add up the, the climate co-benefits, about a third of all the financing is for, for climate components in our projects. Um, so the goals are, 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 you know, climate is just woven throughout everything that World Bank does. And I think a question that naturally arises here is, what is your business model for delivering on this mandate and how do you raise these funds? The World Bank uh, has a AAA credit rating and we issue bonds in the capital markets to raise financing for our projects, as I said. Um, and those bonds are sold through intermediaries, including SEB. And uh, the investors um, that uh, buy our bonds or that provide us with financing are looking for safe and liquid investments. So investments that are easily tradable. Um, and they look for them in different currencies. So that's why investors are attracted to our bonds from a financial perspective. But in addition to that, um, they also like the fact that the World Bank is sort of like a platform um, for sustainable finance. So the funds that we raise, we use for projects that serve a social purpose. And um, if you, you know, if you think of who the investors are, they include official sector investors such as uh, central banks, um, but mostly private sector investors like uh, bank treasuries or asset managers or pension funds. Um, and, and corporations as well. Individuals also buy our bonds, but usually they invest uh, in our bonds through their mutual funds. So we raise funds in the market and we use them to invest in sustainable development projects in our member countries. Um, and I said, as I said earlier, IBRD focuses on middle income countries. So these are countries with income levels above a certain per capita income level, but actually half of the world's poor live in uh, middle-income countries. And we work with governments in these countries. So we support them to achieve their goals 
And those goals could include something like increasing jobs, reducing pollution, providing um, more access to, to healthcare, to education, um, access to clean energy, and so forth. So, so many things. I don't even know where to go to first uh, after this. I'm so curious, but I do want to ask, you said sustainable development, and I noticed that all of your bonds are called sustainable development bonds. So I'm curious, what does that mean? It basically means that all of the funds we raise in the capital markets support sustainable development. Um, and in sustainable bond market terms, it means that proceeds support a mix of green and social projects. And we, we, we did this, we labeled all our bonds as sustainable development bonds because of the mandate of the World Bank. And I've talked about that a little bit. Um, it's not as though we're raising some funds for sustainable activities and other funds for something else or for activities that are not sustainable. Our entire mandate revolves around um, sustainable development. And um, all the activities are financed based on specific performance metrics that they're supposed to achieve. So ultimately, the, they, they're supposed to contribute to the twin goals that I mentioned. Um, so all of our bonds are labeled as sustainable development bonds. And um, we do that because of the mandate of the World Bank. And we're taking a holistic approach. Um, so we're being transparent about everything that we finance and explaining to investors also how we do that. And we have a framework in place, we have impact reporting, um, and we're trying to, to um, explain, you know, things are complex um, and things evolve. Uh, but the, the, the main point is really that everything that we finance um, supports um, sustainable development. What we've been doing with the sustainable development bonds is also mapping projects to sustainable development goals. We engage with investors around certain themes, for example, raising awareness for water and oceans or how gender is included in all our projects or themes like health or nutrition, food loss and waste was a big theme. And we communicate and engage with investors and discuss how the World Bank finances projects that support those themes. And then we tie that back to the sustainable development goals. And in one of our earlier episodes of the podcast, I talked to Christopher Flensborg about the history of the sustainable finance market. And of course, the first ever green bond, which was issued by the World Bank in 2008. And you were also there when it happened and also played a significant role in that transaction, which I can say kickstarted the sustainable finance market, especially for bonds. So what is your perspective on the role that the green bonds or that green bond played in the development of the sustainable uh, finance market? And what are your expectations for how it might evolve even further? Yeah, we've worked uh, together for over a decade, um, actually almost 15 years now, and so much has changed in the market. And, you know, really green bonds played such a massive role in the transformation of capital markets. Um, before green bonds, there was there wasn't, I mean, there was very little focus on what bond proceeds were being used for. Um, and the questions that we got from investors really revolved around the credit and the terms of the bonds. Um, but, you know, as I said, that's completely changed. Um, and as I said earlier, you know, organizations like the World Bank already had sort of purpose and the processes in place for sustainable finance. All projects are financed for intentional impact. We have strict environmental and social safeguards um, and extensive project documentation. And all of that's financed through bonds. So that's really what sustainable finance is about. Um, but green bonds helped catalyze this development in the market that focused more on transparency and purpose. Um, and they helped introduce uh, uh, ESG considerations um, and impact to mainstream investments through a, a, a very simple process. So, you know, it started with uh, um, Scandinavian investors, Swedish investors um, uh, interested in a product that helped them support um, the fight against climate change and um, do that through a very simple, you know, plain vanilla tradable um, product. And um, it has you know, really changed the markets. Investors are now asking much more questions 
um, about how proceeds are being used and issuers are providing more information. There's actually a whole industry now that supports this transparency. Um, and also, I mean, we talked about sustainable development bonds. The market is moving beyond this narrow focus on green. You know, it's not just about supporting renewable energy or energy efficiency or even, you know, adaptation and resilience that we talked about earlier that's becoming, you know, at the forefront of, 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 of attacking climate change. There's recognition that, that green projects should not only include green targets. So the UK recently issued a green bond and in their reporting to investors, they also include social targets. Um, our project, because we have a social mandate, we're reporting to investors about green targets, but also the social targets. So, so you know, green projects also have a social angle. Yeah, but anyway, green bonds really helped uh, kickstart this focus on transparency, purpose, and there's this, this evolution on going beyond green. But speaking of uh, projects, um, I was wondering if you could provide us with some real life examples of the types of projects that the World Bank invests in and maybe even projects in different parts of the world. Um, I'll pick some examples that also help show how you know, climate and social projects are connected. Um, so, I mean, the most obvious link, I guess, would be pollution. Um, high emitting countries um, are grappling with pollution, air pollution, but also waste. Um, in their in, in their major cities, and that has health effects. Um, so I could give an example. We're working with uh, um, some large cities in northern Africa, where um, we're financing projects that help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So renewable energy projects that reduces pollution has positive health effects. Um, and in the same countries, you know, with with the pandemic, um, for many projects, we we shifted the focus. Um, to things like uh, um, uh, providing um, equipment, like PPE equipment and masks, but also at the same time, making sure that there were um, uh, projects in place that helped manage the waste from healthcare services. Um, you know, those, those types of, um, of products have to be properly disposed of. Um, there's other projects, like in Eastern Europe, we're supporting um, energy efficiency, we're working to make public buildings more energy efficient. Um, we're training teachers, these are education projects, um, to provide online learning um, during the pandemic. And we're doing that in, you know, in different countries, there's different ways of doing that. And in, in some countries where students don't have access to computers or other electronic devices, um, we've been working uh, to reach students through radio or TV programs to make sure that they, they can continue learning. Um, so maybe just uh, mentioning some projects in Latin America. Um, there are some projects where we try to provide access to basic healthcare services to hundreds of thousands of people um, through projects that have mobile health units that try to reach people in rural areas. Anyway, those are just some examples. We have hundreds more and for investors, we summarize the, the projects and the impacts in our impact report um, and in our investor presentation that's online. And speaking of investors and you being the head of investor relations at the World Bank, could you elaborate a little more how you cooperate with investors on these topics? Do you do anything in addition to, you know, the standard reporting and the <laughs> communications? Yes, 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 definitely. So we actually like to have direct contact with investors. We like a dialogue. Um, so, and, you know, I mentioned earlier that the conversation has completely changed and this was really catalyzed through, through green bonds and, and this focus on ESG. Um, so let me just give an example. We recently launched an initiative to um, highlight to investors and explain to them the World Bank's climate change action plan and how we're integrating climate in, in all our um, uh, projects. And uh, we, we had we had almost 100, like 80 or more than 80 individual investor calls um, to explain this approach um, of integrating climate in all our projects. And, um, uh, you know, I had a dialogue with investors. They're all thinking about um, integrating ESG or maybe it's self-selecting. The ones that approached us are all thinking about integrating ESG. Um, and uh, we're interested in hearing how we're approaching this. 
and also that it's a it's a journey it's an evolution um we also did uh, workshops they were virtual and we did the net road show um and then we speak at conferences so there's many ways that that we can um uh, reach investors but i think what what we really like is this this direct interaction um and you know we're just an email away um and can quickly get on the phone or or, or do a virtual um a call teams or, or, or WebEx or Zoom. So um, there's many ways to, to um, connect with investors in addition to the reporting that I mentioned. And what kind of questions do you usually get from investors? Oh, it's very different. Um, I mean, there are some investors that are really just starting out and thinking about how to approach this for their portfolios. And there's other investors that ask very specific questions like how do you calculate the greenhouse gas emissions in your, in your projects? Um, so there's a broad range, and um, I think that the questions are getting more specific, uh, and it also helps us. I mean, we learn from these discussions with investors, um, and 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 it helps us figure out what to include in our um, in our reporting as well. How do you measure the emissions in your projects? By the way, I think that's a very good question. I would be curious to hear an answer to that as well. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting question. We have experts who do that. Um, and in our climate change action plan, um, uh, we, we, we explain that. There's a lot of uh, work that goes into calculating, you know, how the reductions are um, compared to a baseline for that country. And if you look at uh, many of our projects, and you know, some of them um, uh, reduce, you know, over a million tons of greenhouse gas emissions per year um, based on the baseline. And the countries that we work in, as I said, are um, developing countries, emerging market countries that have a much lower baseline than some of the developed countries. So this, um, this uh, amount of greenhouse gas emission reductions um, is, is quite high, which is why, you know, for, for uh, a cleaner planet, um, uh, investments in emerging markets are super important. I do want to ask you a question that I always ask at the end of every episode, and I think it's so important to ask it uh, to you specifically, because, um, you know, you have been there when the first green bond was, um, I guess, put, put into place uh, or brought forth into reality. And the question that I want to ask, what advice would you give to someone who maybe works in finance or in another area of business and really wants to integrate sustainability into their work, into the way they think, but just doesn't know where to start? Um, okay, so I think in general, I'm a big fan of the concept just one step at a time. So not expecting something to be perfect before you start with it. Um, you can start with something small and then do more and more. Um, otherwise, tackling anything becomes insurmountable. Um, and also learning from others. So, um, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, learning from others, just getting immersed in the topic. And um, as I said, I think this podcast and other efforts to, to share information are super important um, for that. So just try to learn as much as possible. Um, and I actually recently um, uh, wrote a, a paper um, called Starting on a Sustainable Investing Journey, um, together with a colleague of mine. And that's really, it, it, that's sort of what it's about. It's just, it gives ideas on, on where investors can, can start, um, you know, asking themselves why they're going on this journey. Is it for risk considerations or impact or both? You know, who are their stakeholders? Um, and then just taking, um, taking it from there. And for issuers, I really, you know, we're, um, Issues are at a different place in this journey and um, starting to talk to investors about their approach to sustainability is, is, is a good place to begin. And then labeled bonds, the process is so you know, relatively simple and streamlined um, that uh, it's a good way to, 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 to get into that um, market. Um, so, yeah, I would just say start with something one step at a time and realize that it's not going to be perfect, but it will evolve. Heike, thank you so much for calling in and sharing your insights with us. I really appreciate it, and I'm sure our listeners will too. So this has been Next Generation Finance. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, bye.